All right, well, thank you all for coming today. This is the last block of talks that we have at the, uh, the conference. So thanks for holding out. I know it's been a, a long day and you probably all had a lot of stuff to learn. So I decided to do a talk um, that's probably one of the weirdest ones that I've ever given. Um, and you're all here for that weirdly weird talk. So I love it. I'm glad you're all here. Um, most people probably the last couple of days have been talking a lot about you know, tools and practice and things like that. I wanted to focus a little bit on threats and a little bit on fungus to kind of align those two things together. Those are my passions. And I thought, hey, this seems like a weird cross section in life. Let's see if other folks like this too. So congratulations. You're among like the 12% of the people at the conference who are definitely the coolest people here because you want to hear about cybersecurity and fungus. This is great. Um, We'll probably talk a few different things here. We'll hit on a, a fungus that turns a, another fungus into something else. We'll talk about one that um, infects an organism and changes its behavior. You probably all have actually heard of that one. Um, and we'll talk about one that um, lives in a, a relationship going undetected, right? And we'll kind of end with a, a call to action. But first, who the heck am I to be talking about both cybersecurity and fungus, right? And that's a very, very small sliver on a Venn diagram. Um, so when I went into my educational career, everybody expected me to go into technology, right? You're gonna be a computer scientist, computer engineer, you're gonna go be a programmer, do those things. Being an extremely angsty teenager, I wasn't having any of that, right? I couldn't go do what everybody thought I was gonna go do. So I decided, in my infinite wisdom, that I was gonna go study biology. But not to be a doctor or a vet like everybody else, I was gonna go study weird things. And so ultimately, through a kind of securitist path, I ended up landing in this, this world of fungus um, and I kind of had some, some weird steps along the way. Um, at one point in my senior year, I, I believe I had mushrooms growing on top of my hot water heater. I had plants drying in my windowsills and I had dead bugs in the freezer. And I was shocked that my wife didn't divorce me. Um, and so very, <laughs> very weird interests. Um, and I ended my college career doing uh, a capstone on the convergent evolution of bioluminescence across aquatic and terrestrial organisms. I tell you what, nobody cares. <laughs> I did, nobody else did. Um, but I happened to find the one other person in the world, um, this is Dr. Tom Volk here in the picture next to me in the dryer. Um, Tom found my interests interesting, right? World round medical, medical mycologist. Most of the folks in his program were other medically minded people, but he thought this kid who liked bioluminescence, there's something to that. So he took me into his program and taught me what I know about fungus today. Um, left a couple links in there if you want to hear more about that guy. Fascinating, fascinating individual. Led a really crazy life. Has some great TED Talks that he's given over the years, and I linked to, to those two here as well. So let's get into it, right? The first one we're going to talk about is a cybersecurity threat called Rebirth Botnet. You probably all know what botnets are, right? But we're going to also talk about this very interesting fungus um, called uh, Ophicordyceps unilateral lalis. Um, you all know it as the zombie ant fungus from The Last of Us, right? So if you watched that show, played that video game, uh, you're somewhat familiar with it. Uh, no, it cannot infect humans, like in the show in the game. It only infects ants. Uh, but it, it's rather interesting, right? It actually looks quite a bit like a botnet. Um, it looks specifically um, at a very small tribe of ants um, called uh, Campanodi, I think is how you say it. Um, but when it infects those ants, it specifically alters the behavior of them to do something entirely different. Um, so, you know, normally an ant goes and finds food for its colony and it brings it back. When this fungus infects the ant, it actually causes it to climb to the highest point it can possibly get to, attach itself to the bottom of a leaf, and then a fungus grows from its head and explodes. <laughs> um, so basically it takes this organism, it completely repurposes it, turns it into an infect what we would refer to as a zombie, and does something entirely different, right? Um, if we think about a botnet, that is pretty much a very similar thing, right? A, a malicious piece of software, some malware, whatever it might be, goes and infects a resource. Um, then ultimately, eventually, it repurposes that resource for its own use and does its own thing, right? Starts sending out signals, killing off other stuff, going and, and taking things out. What I thought was particularly interesting about this Rebirth botnet um, uh, particular one is it actually targets gaming services. And I thought that had a pretty nice tie-in with you know, a, a fungus featured in a video game. 
Um, payoff here, like, you know, how does it work? What does it do? On the botnet side, um, at least in this one in particular, they've actually done a lot of work to make it be really accessible. It has a complete, like, pay-to-play model. You can use the free versions of the services. You can pay in crypto to get access to more feature sets, get access to APIs. Um, you can use it to very easily, um, in, you know, install its, uh, its malware and other things and then do other stuff, right? Um, when you're looking at the detection path, like how do I know if this botnet has infected my infrastructure? Um, it's not dissimilar from others, right? You're looking for access to sensitive directories, things like slash temp, slash root, um, uh, you know, binary directories that, uh, or uh, device directories that are running binaries, things like that. Um, it downloads itself via wget. It you know, propagates doing typical things like chamads or doing RMs, things like that. And so when you're looking for this type of thing in your environment, um, and it particularly likes Kubernetes and container-based environments, it's not too terribly hard to find things like that, right? Um, tools out there that you've probably heard about today, like Falco and others, they can do the identification. They can find those things. Um, in the natural world, right, how do we find something like this Cordyceps thing? Thankfully, it's pretty targeted, right? It's, it's a parasite. Um, parasites typically evolve in a very, very narrow path with a particular type of host, um, in this case, a set of ants, and a particular group of tribe, so to speak, of ants. Um, the fun thing about it, though, is they've actually found that the the compounds that this fungus emits in the ant that it causes the ant to produce uh, actually have some pretty interesting, you know, use cases. Um, they are anti-infection molecules, um, so that when the fungus infects the ant, it obviously doesn't want to get outcompeted by some other infection. So it actually secretes stuff to help protect the ant, so that it can be the main host or the main secondary host, secondary pathogen inside of the, the creature. Um, it also has some anti-cancer agents that we've discovered through these different compounds it creates. And then each of the different species in this ant tribe, it actually causes it to produce different compounds. Um, so again, kind of like a botnet, depending on the use case, depending on the thing you're going for, produces different results. Um, so again, a little bit of a weird cross-section there, but I thought that was kind of a, a fun, novel, you know, real-life organism that does something very similar to this cyber threat that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, the last thing I will say about it, and I get this question all the time on all the fungus I ever talk about, you can't eat this one, right? Don't eat it. Not a good situation. The next set, this one is, is really interesting to me. Um, it's actually a set of parasitic plants, right? Which I know plants are not a fungus, um, but they parasitize a fungus that's in a mutualistic relationship with a tree. Right, so very, very kind of weird cross-section of things. And as I was thinking about that, it occurred to me that that's actually what's happening with a newer attack that's out there that's called LLM jacking. So I don't know, um, well, I should give you the names, right? So one of the plants we'll talk about is uh, Monotropa uniflora. You can actually find this plant in the woods here in Washington. If you go out hiking towards the Olympic uh, National Rainforest in that area, um, you'll actually find this thing all over the place if you go look for it. Um, fascinating plant, has no chlorophyll, lives completely off parasitizing a fungus. Um, same thing with this orchid you actually see next to it. Um, I can't say that one. I don't know it off the top of my head. <laughs> but this orchid in particular has two variants. The variant we have here today is one that actually is an albino orchid. So again, has no chlorophyll. It actually parasitizes a fungus to be able to live. So on the LLM jacking side, right, you know, what do we have here? Uh, this attack is pretty interesting because it's a fairly new thing that's come out. It's leveraging a not-so-new exploit. Um, it actually exploits the CVE I have listed here. Um, and all it really does is run remote execution of code, right? It's a pretty traditional attack that we see across a lot of different paradigms. What makes it a bit more unique is they are specifically targeting LLMs, and they're specifically trying to not be detected, right? They're not actually trying to stop the LLM or cause it to give bad results, what their goal is, is to actually set up a reverse proxy and re-host the LLM. So their intent is to basically steal queries, hide in plain sight, and then be able to leverage somebody else's infrastructure to power their service that they're trying to run. Um, if we actually look at the overall costs of this, the LLM host is paying upwards of $46,000 per day with this type of attack, right? LLMs are not cheap to operate, and so this becomes a very, very lucrative attack to do against those hosts. Um, if you look at this blog down here and go to it, you'll see some of the, the places that it's specifically targeting. We're talking, you know, fairly strong services like OpenAI or um, some of the other main providers that are out there right now. Um, and so it's, it's not insignificant 
it's fairly, fairly new, um, but is being used in kind of more unique ways. Uh, how to mitigate, how to deal with the situation if you're at an organization trying to run public LLMs. It's really about leveraging real-time detections of things going on in your environment, right? You're not going to necessarily find these things um, just by doing posture stuff alone, because as uh, new exploits show up, as these CVEs age, as they get exposed to the internet, you can only do so much to kind of protect yourself before deployment, or maybe there's no fix for the particular library you're trying to use. So being able to kind of go through least privilege access, being able to do things around robust secrets management, those come into play pretty strongly. Um, realistically, a lot of this threat is about moving in the environment, finding access to keys to AWS things, um, to finding access to, to cloud, uh, cloud keys to access services. So doing things to kind of limit what your service accounts have access to, kind of all that due diligence, that's where you need to focus with kind of the, the more modern LLM jacking attack. On the fungus side, you know, how does it look like LLM jacking? Um, it basically does the very similar concept to a reverse proxy. Um, so you have a, a plant that doesn't have chlorophyll. It has to get energy some way, right? Most of the time, a plant is a, um, uh, an autotroph, right? Meaning it produces its own energy, produces its own food. Um, most fungus are heterotrophs. Um, in this case, you have a, a plant that has to be a heterotroph. So how does it do it? It's actually formed a very, very tight relationship with a mycorrhizae. And so if you don't know what a mycorrhizae is, um, it is an ascomycete. Um, and that ascomycete is a filamentous type fungus. And it typically grows among the roots of trees and plants. It helps it take up nutrients um, and help break down um, nitrogen, fix carbon back into the soil, things like that. These particular plants have developed an extremely unique relationship with that mycorrhizae to be able to parasitize it and actually steal the nutrients that it's pulling from the, from the ground, so to speak, and giving out to trees that it also has a relationship with. So traditionally, the mycorrhizae exists in conjunction with a tree, right? Tree is producing, um, it's, an, uh, it's an autotroph, right? It's producing nutrients from sunlight via chlorophyll. It's feeding the fungus. The fungus is helping it um, fix carbon back into the soil, take up nitrogen, things like that. Um, and it, these other plants have discovered how to also hook into that mycorrhizal network that feeds that tree and then steal kind of a little bit, just a tiny little bit of energy that the tree would normally get. So it kind of goes undetected doing its own thing. So in that regard, it looks an awful lot like this reverse proxy concept. Um, again, it's, it's a very, very specific uh, host relationship. Most parasites are in an extremely co-evolved relationship with the thing they parasitize, and so they end up being very, very specific, just like the, uh, the cordyceps we just talked about. Um, again, if you see these plants out there in the wild, uh, don't eat them. They can be toxic, right? <laughs> you don't want to do that. You'll have a, it probably won't take you down, but you'll have a couple of really bad days if you do that. Um, let's see, this, this next one I'm going to talk about here is an attack called Scarlet Eel. Um, a little bit older, but very cloud-focused attack. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it or not, but it is definitely a multi-phase thing. And we're going to also talk about a, a fungus that, again, that is similar, that is called um, Hyptomycetes lactiforium. This one also grows here in the Northwest. I found it many times when I'm out mushroom hunting for chanterelles. Um, it grows also in the Olympic National Forest, so all over the place. Um, We'll start on the, the fungus this side, so why not? It's, it's a pretty fun one. Um, also, an ascomycete. Um, and if you think about ascomycetes, what else are there? We just talked about some filamentous fungus. But you probably know it more like yeast, right? So yeast is an ascomycete. Um, it's used in everything for the, throughout all of human history, right? Um, the fun thing about this fungus is that it infects three particular genuses of other fungus. So it goes after Lactarius, uh, Lactiferius, and Rushula. Um, those three fungus in and of themselves are typically not edible, um, not super toxic, but not something that you would just go and eat for no reason. Um, what's interesting though is once it gets infected by this ascomycete, it rewrites the fungus's DNA completely and replaces it with something that's entirely different. Um, it actually ends up turning that non-edible Rushula or that non-edible Lactarius into something that is, in fact, edible and actually quite tasty. Um, it, uh, it's a pretty kind of unique process, um, and you see them fairly often, and ultimately it turns into something that's not really a mushroom anymore. Um, and that's, again, not dissimilar from what we see in these scarlet eel-based attacks. So in this one, um, it's extremely specific to AWS, um, and it is basically trying to repurpose your infrastructure into doing something malicious, right? 
um, typically in the kind of the phase one of the attack, it's going to repurpose the existing infrastructure. It's going to install things like crypto miners. Um, at the, the cost model that we saw with this attack, it was roughly $4,000 a day in host cloud costs. So again, not insignificant, not as much as an LLM jacking, but still not a, not a tiny number either. Um, and their ultimate goal is to actually get privilege escalation, persistence, and IP theft. So the intent is to install crypto mining to make a little bit of cash and then act as kind of that red canary to make you go look at this pretty shiny thing over here on the left uh, while they're really trying to take and do things and persist in the environment to do a lot more with what you've got. They're basically trying to take over and then do a bunch of different things to either steal IP or rehost things, you know, use it for their own use cases, use botnets, things like that. Um, in this case, if we're looking at, you know, how do we detect that type of activity, what can we do? Um, it's a lot of, again, endpoint detection type stuff. We're looking for key discovery. We're looking for um, curls, for service redirects. Um, basically, we're going through the environment looking for abnormal usage of the infrastructure in ways that we're not expecting. Um, again, it's typically something you could do with a detection-oriented tool as opposed to a preventive-oriented tool. Um, but it needs kind of a blend of both worlds. Um, we're going to use exploits and misconfigurations to break in, and then we're going to go do um, uh, you know, discovery, access authorization, steal of keys, things like that. And typically, this has a pretty significant dwell time to it. Like, they'll install crypto miners, they'll let you go remediate those crypto miners, and then you know, days later, they'll start doing something else with the access that they have. I'm not going to move too fast on that one. Um, again, pretty interesting attack. We've seen it a couple of different times and a couple of different iterations of this attack over the last uh, year or so. So definitely one to keep an eye on. You'll definitely see more and more of it, I suspect. Um, and then, you know, on, again, the right-hand side, it's a, a very interesting uh, fungus, a very interesting thing that we deal with uh, that has some pretty, pretty fun results, right? There's not a lot of um, things out there that will go and infect something else and turn it into yet a third thing that can be used completely differently. Um, let's see. So last one here. What's my time? Uh, 18 minutes. So this one isn't an attack, um, and it's an offense. And I kind of wanted to talk about it um, mostly because it's a pretty hot term in the industry right now. We'll probably all hear that term CNAP, uh, Cloud Native Application Protection Platform. Um, and all it really is is a bundle of a lot of different things. Um, and as I was thinking about that for this talk, I'm like, you know what? Hyphae, the thing that the mushrooms actually composed of, the stuff that grows underground for the fungus, doesn't, again, look dissimilar from what we see around things that are combining a bunch of different tools into one protective platform. And so what do I mean by that? Um, basically, if we look at a CNAP offering, it is layers of defense for modern architecture. We're talking preventative use cases around things like CSPM and KSPM and vuln management and bug bounty programs and infrastructure as code analysis, things like that. On the detective side, we're talking XDR, CDR, um, application protection solutions, uh, log analysis, kind of all those things that we can use to do interrogation. And on the response side, you know, things like integrating with SOARS, ticketing, real time, like uh, kind of action and responses to activity. And so you're finding this gigantic category of tool that's doing about the work of probably, you know, eight or ten different tools. Incredibly complex to not only build but also maintain. Um, if you want to learn more about it, I've got kind of a long link down here at the bottom. Um, but uh, the company I work for, Sysdig, has done a pretty good job building kind of like the cloud native fundamentals guide to explain all this ridiculous terminology that's coming out. So what does that have to do with a Heifel cell, right? What does that look like on the, the fungus world? Um, well, if we kind of take a step back and we think about CNAP as this big, gigantic thing, um, I don't know if you guys all knew this or not, but the largest organism on the planet is not a blue whale. It's actually a fungus. So it lives in southeastern Washington and northwestern Oregon. It spans three and a half square miles and weighs about 35,000 tons, right? That's a... It's a pretty darn big organism, right? Um, and it does that because a fungus basically starts somewhere and it grows out radially, you know, across all sides all at the same time. It never stops. And if we think about, you know, how, how can it subsist, how can it sustain itself like that, it's kind of hard to see if we go back a slide, but in this picture there is kind of a description of what a, a fungal cell looks like. And there's some key characteristics here, like you have the, the front of it, that is the thing that's always kind of pushing through the, the substrate that you're, you're growing through, going and finding new nutrients, new medium to be able to pull stuff from. 
And then you have a, a cell wall and a cell membrane, and you have this little area here in the middle um, that actually connects each hyphal cell together. So some fungal cells are completely closed off, and some have a little hole. It's a little bit interesting, right? And what that means is that all of these fungal cells that have that hole are multinucleated. So they have multiple nuclei living all around the cell in various spots. Normally, we think about a cell and a nucleus as a one-to-one -one relationship, right? Each cell has one nucleus. It does in this case, but they can move freely between cells. What that, if you look at the purple picture, all those really dark purple dots, those are nuclei, right? And so you can see they're really heavily concentrated at the edge of the picture, because that's where the tips of all of the hyphae are. And so what it's doing is it's concentrating all of its resources kind of at the perimeter, right? It's looking to the edge of its, of its life, of where it is, and it's putting all of its resources on that front. One to, you know, grab nutrients and bring them back, but also to be able to, you know, quickly grow, to quickly digest, to quickly respond to things that happen. If we look at that little, like, gap that we have between cells, there's actually another organelle specific to a, a fungus that exists that when that breaks, it immediately plugs that hole to protect it so it doesn't lose all of its cytoplasm, leak out all of its liquids, things like that. And so this hyphal cell has a large number of things going on from both this you know, notion of a preventative and a detective context. So it's, again, not dissimilar from these larger protection platforms that we're seeing come out there. Um, oh, there it is. So the, that organelle that blocks off that little hole, it's called a Warren, um, yeah, a Warren body. And so you can look that up if you want to look into it, see more about it. It's a pretty cool little thing. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it gives the fungal cell a lot of diversity, a lot of ways to be able to deal with situations that come at it because of how it can exchange different assets, different organelles throughout the, the entire network of it. Um, and again, you know, if you've ever actually had a product called corn, Q-U-O-R-N, you might have seen it in your local grocery store, you've eaten it, right? That's, that's all hyphae, that's all fungus that's uh, kind of smashed together and flavored into these things that are approximately like chicken or like beef. So with all that information, right, you know, what can we do with it? What does it mean for us? Um, basically, the point here that I'm trying to make is that there are a lot of different models for attacks that exist. Um, and these, these models are not dissimilar from things that we see in the wild, right? It's, it's not necessarily new concepts. There are novel organisms that do very, very similar things. Um, but what we do need to do is come up with a model of defense that kind of meets that requirement, meets that need. Um, and so I think if you heard me talk yesterday at the keynote, I'm very passionate about security models that are keeping up with how things have evolved, right? Where are we today, not where we were yesterday. So there's this great little website, again, my company puts out called Slash 555. It's a benchmark you can go look at if you'd like that talks about how to build a modern security model that maps to attacks like I've talked about today. Things that are specifically targeted at the cloud, targeted at containers, Kubernetes, um, things in that regard. The other thing I'd love to see everybody do is spend time learning, right? It doesn't matter if it's cybersecurity, if it's fungus, if it's, you know, the history of the space program. It can be whatever you want it to be. What I've learned in my career though so far is inspiration comes from ex extremely unexpected places, right? And that was the point of this talk, is that why would I talk about fungus and cybersecurity? It's because there's ways to think about these things that apply to your actual life in ways you didn't think about, right? So if you're not spending time learning, you're not spending time reading, not spending time diving into your passions, you're doing yourself a disservice, right? Spend time learning about those things because you never know what's gonna cause inspiration for you. Um, and then the last point here is that robust defenses are the best defenses. If our, if our fungal, fungal brethren are doing it as they try to exist and persist throughout their entire life cycle, it's what we should be doing too, right? We shouldn't be putting all of our eggs in one basket. We shouldn't be focusing on just preventative controls. We shouldn't be focusing on just detective controls. We have to have a blend of those things to be able to have a effective security model and be able to produce the results that we're looking for. Um, the last thing I have here on a quote is from one of my absolute favorite books. Surprise, surprise, I'm a nerd. I like to read science fiction. Um, but uh, towards the end of it, he says, you know, evolution has a sneaky way of working on a problem from every angle. We have to think the same way, right? We can't just be myopic in how we want to approach these things. So that's what I have. I went a little bit quick, and so I've got about, you know, we've 10 minutes left, and so I, I won't belabor any of the points. But if you all have questions, I'm happy to answer them as best I can.